I said to somebody when they were walking in today, I said, you know, for the last six months I've been saying we're going to start our, our downstairs service, uh, and I've been saying that for six months, and uh, I said to somebody when they walked in this morning, you're going to know when you walk in today that it is time to start the downstairs service. Before COVID, we had worship up here, and then we had uh, a service downstairs, and we, ha we ate food, and <laughs> it's like elf. <laughs> you want to go out and eat food? Uh, we went downstairs, and we ate and had an informal thing in the, in the social hall, and then we had our main primary up here at 11. Uh, and things are going to look different now, but I've been yearning to get the downstairs started because when we, when COVID hit, we were having 40, 45 people for the downstairs breakfast church, and of the 45, 40 never came to church here in the sanctuary. It was a whole different group of people, and so I, there's a there's a need for that. And, uh, and so, as the inside keeps coming back and keeps coming back, um, probably after Easter, I think Diane and I are going to take a, it's her birthday, month, and week. <laughs> and uh, so, after Easter, I think we're going to miss a Sunday and probably take a couple weeks <coughs> off. And then when we come back from that, I foresee us starting the downstairs service. And it'll be later, so it'll be good for those of you who don't like uh, to get up earlier uh, to make the 9.30. Um, the announcement this, announcements this week, uh, today at 2 o'clock, I want everybody here to meet me at the mall between 1.30 and 2, so that you can watch 20 minutes of previews. <laughs> That's right. And then watch the Jesus Revolution. And uh, I'm not exaggerating about that. that, and that it's like 15 or between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, and so I will be standing. I told uh, a couple others. Uh, I'll be wearing a Samaritan's orange Samaritan's purse shirt standing outside the theater. And you come up and see me. And I think Phil Matthews from the Wiley Ford Church of the Brethren is going to be with me. And so you come up, but you come up and see me, and I'll give you your tickets. We bought 100 tickets. I already have them at the house. Uh, and they are, we'll give those out. I'm not sure which theater we're going to be in. He said some of the theaters hold 200 and some, some only hold 100 and some. And so if we, if we, if we use all those tickets, which I pray we do, then we will uh, buy more tickets. And if that show sells out, there's a 3 o'clock showing. So if you are there at, you know, 5 till 2 and, and that show sold out, I just ask you to go kill an hour in the mall and uh, then come back and, and we'll, have, we'll buy tickets for the 3 o'clock show. We have no limit on the number of tickets we can buy. Um, so that is today at 2. It's really exciting. And uh, Monday, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I, I wanted to put on Facebook, but then I, I just didn't. Because, you know, I always think I'm funny. And uh, sometimes I'm not. And... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to write, and when you get your ticket, we'll give you a free pack of M&Ms and a water you can sneak in. <laughs> but then I thought, it's a church. Here in um, I don't think you go to hell for sneaking water in the theater, just for the record. Uh, Monday at 10 o'clock, they're packing food for thought. That is something we do every week, that we take food to the schools. And they pack once a month with non-perishables, and uh, and we send those home with kids at at Wiley Ford and uh, Frankfurt Middle School. 
And if you want to help pack those tomorrow at 10 o'clock, it's a big job. Uh, Tuesday at 5.30, we have our community dinner. And since we're in the midst of egg making, we're doing those dinners at the fire hall. This week is chicken. <coughs> we have about 80 people on average now. Uh, we're back to 80 at the dinners. And uh, you're welcome. It's a great night. Uh, we have an administrative board meeting at 7, so that'll put a little damper on my evening. Uh. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and nobody laughed. <laughs> uh, Wednesday at 2, uh, there's a Short Gap Women's Ministries meeting. Uh, if you're wondering what that is, that is the group formerly known as United Methodist Women. United Methodist Women have rebranded themselves nationwide and they're not really using United Methodist Women anymore. And so the local women here have rebranded themselves also to give it a more local flavor. And uh, so the Short Gap Women's Ministries meeting is at two o'clock Wednesday. Uh, we're, we're caught up on the eggs right now, and so we're going to, everybody's been super faithful about coming. We're going to take a break this week on the egg making, and then we'll resume next week. Uh, and then also someone just said to me, uh, are we not having Wednesday night service at 7? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, Freudian slip. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, you can go home and Google it. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. I just don't have it on here. That's 7 o'clock Wednesday night. It is a, it's a worship service, but it's not like Sunday morning. Sunday morning, I'm just going to be honest with you. I feel like I have to, I can't be boring. I, I want you going home, wanting to come back on Sunday. Wednesday nights is about being, about going deeper. And what I told them Wednesday night, next week, we had... We had 35 or 40 people probably Wednesday night. And I said, next week we might have 10 because people thought this was, this was not what I thought it was going to be. Uh, we read Romans, and different people came up and read one verse of Scripture, and it took us 30 minutes. We, we, we met for an hour, and 30 minutes of it was reading Scripture. And we read through the entire 8th chapter of Romans, 39 verses. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do this week, but this is, this is about, Wednesday nights are about more of God, more of God. Sunday mornings, we got lost people in here. You get this many people together, somebody doesn't know Jesus. I mean, there's no doubt, right? Do you agree with that? Somebody doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ if you get this many people together. So you got to present the gospel every Sunday. Wednesday nights is more, really more for people who are saved and who want more of Jesus. So that's Wednesday night at 7. Uh, and I think that's it for the week. What's that? You're still come if you're not saved. Oh yeah, you can still come if you're not saved on Wednesday night. Thanks for clarifying that, Larry. Well, I ain't saved, I can't go on Wednesday night. I didn't mean to give you that impression. But thanks for pointing that out. You heathens are welcome on Wednesday night. All right. Okay. Any other announcements? Don did want me to mention that next week they're doing birthdays at Dawnview on Wednesday, but that'll be on next week's up and coming because uh, it's too much for this week. Any other announcements? We also have a Wednesday meeting. And there will be a women's meeting next Monday night, which is a women's spiritual formation group. Any other announcements? Okay. And we do this thing called birthdays. If you have your birthday around about today, you can come up and put a penny in for every year you've been alive, and we will sing to you. Any birthdays around about today? Hi, Happy birthday. How old? Nine. I'm okay. I have. I'm going to change it back. How much you need? <laughs> Sometimes it's so close to a dollar that seventy-six. Oh, you don't look a day over seventy-five. <laughs> Thank you so much for this day and for every person.
person that you brought here today, you know, Lord, who is sitting here who wants more of you. You know who is sitting here who needs to get back on the right path, and you know who is sitting here who needs today to say, yes, God, I have sinned, and I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and uh, I want to be saved today. You know every heart and every mind. And so I thank you for every person that you brought here. We are all on different parts of prayerfully of the same path. And we give you thanks and praise. We pray that you would move mightily in our worship of you today. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to start with Diane singing. <coughs> She always used to say, when am I going to be singing? Or, and, I would all, and I would always say, okay, after this or after that. Now it's like she doesn't even ask anymore. All right. And that's her and whenever she's ready. <clears throat> I see the name of Jesus over you, in your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move, I speak the name cause it's all that I can do, in desperation I'll seek heaven and pray this for you.
there are 20 of you out there right now who the first time you heard this song, you had to pull the car over. <laughs> and uh, as Diane started to, as Diane s sent me that and told me that's what she was going to sing today, uh, my prayer the whole time has just been that she could make it through it. Because uh, there are so many of us who are praying in Jesus' name over people that we love. And, uh, that song is personal to her, and uh, personal, I'm sure, to many of you. I pulled the car over and started crying the first time I heard it. So, all right. So we're going to let the kids go now.
Scott had mentioned last week he spoke in church. He had been in a dark place. So um, I'm coming from you from a very personal story. Um, I know when I survived this, it was God telling me, you need to share, you need to speak. So how are you doing today? And be honest. Be honest. How many times do we pass someone and we're how are you doing? Good and you're and your head's down and you keep on walking. Now how are you really doing? Great. Right? Why do you think you're doing great today? I don't know. I'm here. <laughs> I'm glad you're having a great day. Um, how are you feeling today? Doing pretty wonderful. Doing pretty wonderful? And that is a wonderful thing to be able to experience. Is there anybody here that you're not having a very good day? Anybody? Kind of feeling down? A little dark? You're definitely in the right place, if so. But how many times, though, do you see people and they just appear as happy as can be on the outside? And they have it all together. Do you think that's truly how they feel? Not necessarily. It's one of those things, kind of, goes a little, little bit goes a long, long way. <clears throat> it, because we truly don't know what other people are going through. So, um, like I said, I'm a survivor. I'm a suicide survivor. Um, I had a wonderful life growing up. Good family, good support system. I was involved in school. I got picked on just like everybody else. We had that kind of stuff then, but it's nothing like what dirt is now. Married my high school sweetheart. Still married, still loving life together. Blessed with two beautiful daughters who, I mean, they are driven. And I always say, my dad, he could watch Jeopardy and he knew the answer to everything. And my oldest daughter has received that same gift of genius. Um, I don't know what happened to me. I think it skipped a generation, that's for sure. They're both nurses. They both love and care for other people. Both have wonderful spouses. And I'm blessed with a wonderful grandson. But my daughter's senior year in high school, she was overcoming anorexia. Nobody knew that. We did. Um, Beautiful girl, inside and out. She um, cheered at Mountain Ridge. She, anything she put her mind to, she could do. So we started into her senior year. A boy asked her out. I said, well, you know, I actually graduated from high school with his dad. I know of the family. They've always been good supporters of school. Okay, you can go out with them. And, you know, um, not to give away too much information because you know you live in a small town. Somebody always knows somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, soccer all star at Fort Hill. Nice looking kid. Will come to our house. He was so polite. He was what you would want for your daughter. Treated her very, very well. Then it went from that to had to be with her all the time. Well, we're getting all serious. We're seniors. I don't know. Well, we're always involved. We're always here. So, lo and behold, her whole senior year passes. Things were starting to occur that really, I could take. I could just tell it was taking a toll on her mental health. Lo and behold, he was abusing her verbally, physically, sexually. These are things that are all coming out now as we are moving on in life. Um, my relationship with her was going downhill very quickly. And I just looked at my daughter and thought, I'm going to lose her. I am going to lose her. So, you know, most days um, when your child graduates from high school, it is such a joyous occasion. You see your, their future. You see everything they've accomplished. Our day of high school was spent in the courthouse getting a restraining order. Because the night before, he had taken her, pitched her out of, out of a car that was, was moving. Um, and it's funny how God works. Out by AC in the hospital and give the road there that you take to go to the country club. Lo and behold, the pharmacist at the finance center was getting off of work and was stopped there at the road to pull out. 
He saw this kid do this to my daughter. He got out of the car. He scooped her up, put her in the car, um, and uh, brought her to us. So from that incident, we had to go get a restraining order. And I said, yeah, this is it. Like, we can't, we can't deal with this. And um, so we go to the police station. She is a mess. I'm a mess. Um, we have the restraining order in place. And if, if any of you have any experience with domestic violence, I totally agree and respect with the court system. But when you have to go and get in the same room as the person who has harmed your child or who has harmed you, it's really, it's just, it's awful. So, you know, the day, this Fort Hill graduated one evening, the next evening, Mountain Ridge graduated where my daughter went to school. She, uh, we went to her graduation ceremony and um, my dealings that day were with the school resource officer who, because of where I worked at, was a very good friend of mine. He had to have a description of this boy, so we did. My graduation, uh, you know, experience for her was just looking around the room because the kids graduated at Frostburg State from Mountain Ridge, so it's huge, to make sure that he wasn't there to hurt her. So um, she spent some time that summer where she went um, and stayed for a couple weeks with her godmother out of town because we knew she would be safe there. All of this time, people were telling me, Nikki, he's putting TikTok videos of riding past your house with a baseball bat. He's, um, you know, he broke into our house. He would call me, message me, if I can't have her, nobody can. I was losing it. We would, I would let the police know, you know, um, they were, vigilant and keeping up with things. So fast forward a little bit more. She starts college out at AC, plays volleyball, loving life. He starts coming back around. But with the restraining order, only within so much proximity. I would be there watching her volleyball games. I'd look out in the hallway he would be standing there. And whenever I tell you I am a firm believer that the devil can possess people on earth, I've seen it myself firsthand, and it is very, very scary. Um, and I'm, I'm not making fun of this young man. He needs help. He truly does. Um, but when you're a parent, you look out for your own children. So um, he started coming back around. She was... She always, she told me now, Mom, I took everything out on you of what he did to me. I can see that now. So in October of 2016, you know, if she was even five minutes late from my home school, I was like, oh my golly, he's, he's got a hold of her. You know, she's not home from volleyball practice. It was dark on campus. I literally put a tracker on her car um, because I was that petrified. Um, of what he was going to do to her. And I'm sure there's a lot of details I'm leaving out. I'm just giving you the gist of everything. If you have a child, just imagine if somebody else was doing this to them. So she um, had a big explosive episode with me at home where she, and I understand you're in college, you need to have some freedom, you know, but I just thought, I cannot save my daughter's life. I'm going to literally watch him kill her. So I sunk to my all-time low that evening, and I took 100 Xanax and went to bed for the evening in hopes of not waking up because I thought if I cannot get my child and save my child from this, I cannot walk on this earth. And if any of you know anyone who has attempted suicide, whether they have been successful or not successful, or battle any kind of mental illness, when you get to this point that you feel that this is your only choice, they are not seeing you and the hurt they're going to cause to you. There is nothing, nothing you could have done in that split second where you snap 
and you do this to yourself that anybody could have ever done to save me. So the next morning, I woke up. Um, both of my girls looked at home. I think um, my oldest daughter got up. She thought I'd had a stroke because I wasn't making any sense. Um, and I was kind of slurring my words. And she was like, Mom, what's wrong? And I said, okay, just I just need to sleep. She said no, so she called 911. And, um, you know, it's funny how God has put people in your life and they kind of pop back up. The gentleman who came to the house that was a state trooper um, used to work with me years ago out at Rocky Gap. Um, I would work out there summers um, whenever I was off from the school board. He came and picked me up. He said, Nikki, we're not going to get an ambulance or anything. It's just me. And I said, Sean, I'm fine. Just let me be, you just, so then my daughter started telling him what was going on and what we were dealing with. And he was like, nope. So he put me in the car, buckled me in and took me to the hospital. That was the last thing I remember because if you know anything about medication, if, if you take Xanax for anxiety or anything, you take one. Um, and that usually has a good effect as far as relieving your severe anxiety. Keep in mind, I took 100. Now, I'm not a teeny tiny person, but that was enough to probably tranquilize two elephants. So um, I can remember waking up in the emergency room and looking over and seeing my husband on one side. Now, my husband drives to Fort Dietrich and Frederick and back every day, so he had to come flying back from Fort Dietrich. And the other person I saw whenever I woke up, um, and she's not here today, it's one of my best friends, Gina, um, she had left school, came flying down to hold my hand, and in the meantime, like, I was with it, but I wasn't with it. So, they took me upstairs. I stayed in behavioral health. If you've never stayed there, consider yourself lucky. Um, met a lot of people there that I thought, my golly, how do they even survive to be where they are at today? Um, it just, and I can remember telling the doctor in there, I don't belong here, but you have to stay for three days. So basically you go to intensive counseling sessions and you talk about things and they meet with you individually. And when he met with me individually, I did not realize how bad my anxiety was from everything and the toll that it took on my mental health. Um, and like he was telling me, now, in the emergency room, you told me this and we went over this. I can even remember speaking to that gentleman in the emergency room. So um, the chest pains that I was having, pain going down my arm, not being able to sleep, it was all severe anxiety. So in order to be discharged, I believe you have to have a placement plan. So mine was to go to counseling. Um, my family had to come in and meet. And looking back now, like as a mother, I'm like, oh my golly, I put my children through hell. I put my husband and my friends through hell. But going back to when you get to that dark point in your life, you're not in control anymore. You really, truly aren't. Um, so I started going to counseling. And I will say this much, there was a Cumberland City officer I would sing his praises from here on out. Vince Monleon, I don't know if anyone in here knows him. He, uh, while I was in the hospital, he sat Cameron down and talked to her and said, honey, I'm gonna tell you right now, I know moms and daughters aren't always gonna get along, but if you do not listen to your mother and really take heed as far as what she is telling you, you're gonna end up exactly like the lady down on Old Town Road who was just murdered by her, I don't know if it was her boyfriend or if it was um, her husband. And I think that was an eye opener there. So, um, you know, as we move on forward a little bit more, um, I tell you, there is not a single day that goes by that I don't Praise God and thank God. I woke up from a miracle. The doctor specifically said, I do not see how you are here. 
Your heart should have stopped. You should have been long gone from taking those within a couple hours. You should have passed away in your sleep. So I said to him, I said, um, Bob, I said, then that shows me um, God needs me to go speak to other people who have been here. And uh, I don't, you guys are all from West Virginia. I don't know if you knew this or not, but a couple years ago, um, your state superintendent, his wife killed himself, killed herself, reached out to me to speak. Um, I recently have, because I'm very um, passionate about this, um, when they offered through the Allegheny County Health Department, it's a mental health first aid responder uh, course and certification. That was another thing I kind of spoke to Scott on, um, was that if anybody needs anything, they gave us a little bit more in depth as far as who you can talk to, numbers you can reach out to, because literally in our area, um, there is such a great need for this. If you call and try to get an appointment, especially for a child, it is six months out. What can happen in those six months? So when I completed this course, um, I posted my certificate on Facebook to share. If anyone need anything, let me know. Literally within a few hours, I had five people reach out to me. They were all for children. What does that tell you that our children are facing in schools today? And as Scott said the other week, when on an ambulance call, Bailey Van Meter, kid didn't want to go to school. That says a lot. It's not laziness. It's what they're dealing with. So, um, you know, God has definitely given me a second chance at life that I never should have had. And, um, you know, the Tim McGraw song, Look Like You're Dying, um, Live like you're dying. Still have good days and still have bad days. Everybody does. This world is darn tough to live in. But I will tell you, my faith and my family, that's what carried me through. So fast forward a little bit more now. I can forgive this person for what they did to my child. When my daughter got married, she married the most incredible young man. And here's a little chuckle to go along with this. She was going out to AC and she was like, Mom, he's a baseball player. I thought, great, the only worst thing when the baseball player is out, that, out at AC for the party and the carrying on the basketball team. Okay, well, he'll be here and gone in two weeks and that'll be it. Please forgive me for judging others because he is the most incredible son-in-law I could ever ask for. And I told him that story, and here was the funny part. She called, she was like, Mom, can I bring Ryan up to meet you and Dad? I was like, I took my eyebrows off for the night, my makeup. <laughs> you can go talk to your dad. Okay. My husband. <laughs> Total jock in high school, you know, loved the sports and stuff, still a little stocky, muscular thing, not huge, stocky. Jordan, you've met him before. <laughs> um, Ryan comes in, shakes his hand, my husband's laying there. I got the high blood pressure now and I'm not feeling too good tonight. And I thought, my golly, Cameron told me all of this. And I thought, this kid is probably thinking, what in the world has she brought me into? <laughs> Mom took her eyebrows off and won't meet me in that. But um, so as they started to um, talk about starting a family, um, you know, and it's kind of too. I want you to see how things can still continue to creep back up in life from past traumas. She went through all kinds of testing. He went through all kinds of testing. One thing she had to have um, was a procedure where they go up through the cervix and check to make sure that um, fallopian tubes are open and everything's functioning properly. When the doctor went to do her procedure, he told her, he said, Cameron, you have so much scar tissue on your cervix. This is really going to be painful to do. Once she was like, no, it wasn't bad. It's okay. 
So she calls me and tells me, and I said, honey, I said, why would you have all that scar tissue from, I don't understand, like you don't, you haven't really had problems or anything. And she said, Mom, the doctor told me it was from being um, traumatized or someone forcing themselves on me. That was the point that she actually confessed to me what all he used to do to her. At that time, I had two choices. I could have let the devil overcome me with rage and anger and hate, but I praise God. Thank you, God, for that physician finding this problem. Thank you, God, for her being away from this. Now, my husband, on the other hand, when he came to me, I told him, I saw him grab his keys and head for the door. I was like, whoa, stop right there. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to kill him, Nick. And I said, what for? I said, we have a doctor that figured out the problem. They're not going to have any problems from here on out. And I don't think you're going to want to be somebody's love buddy in jail. <laughs> you just stay here with me. I said, man, you Catholics, you're angry if you're not gambling, huh? <laughs> so he was like, you know, Nick, I'm glad you stopped me. He said, and made me change my way of thinking. Because if not, I probably would have ended up just exactly where you said, in jail. You ask any man about it. Mm -hmm. Your little girl, she will always, the girls will always be your little girls. You will always defend them to the ends of the earth. And you don't have to bring it up yet, safe. but get ready. So it was interesting. All that my daughter still deals with stuff. Um, she can't, if her husband has to go back to Hershey, um, where he's from, for medical appointments because he did have cancer at one point, now he has Crohn's disease, she cannot stay at the house by herself. She comes and stays at our house. She's constantly looking over her shoulder. She keeps a loaded gun in her house. That is what this has done for her. Um, 31 through 39. And that's okay. We learn to cook. We'll get by day by day. Um, and she will still tell you, everything I went through, I would do it all over again because it means I would be where I am now in my life. She talks to people about domestic violence about sexual abuse, not only physical abuse, and I'll speak to anybody, or be listening in, or help find anyone, a place to go, someone to talk to, um, and a plan if you are struggling with mental illness. And, we, and I don't even want to say mental illness, it's mental health, um, because can you stop a heart attack by Thinking happy thoughts, no. Can you get your blood sugar under control by, I'm just not gonna deal with this today, it's not gonna bother me today, no. Mental health is the same as any other kind of health, um, and there is no shame in it whatsoever. Amen. And in closing, the only thing I can tell you, if you cannot relate to anything I just said, go home and praise God because you are one blessed soul. Amen. Thank you. Amen. You don't know me, but I have to do this. You said you were a survivor. Yes. I was suicide. I'm a survivor in a totally different way. And because it's this week, because Tuesday will be 25 years ago, that my first husband, father of my three children, ate a 44 for breakfast one morning. And I was from here to you from. Now, of course, we've been arguing. Most men kill their wife, turn around, and kill themselves. Just the way the world is. Why am I here? I don't know. My children were home, they were up in bed. I had to call 911, I had to call his parents. I don't even know how I got through that day. Because of my faith, my family, my community. I live out in the toes. 
we're all, they just all, put, everybody took care of me. So, I uh, just want to say when you think about you're having a bad day, my kids to this day, and we don't talk about it much, we kind of private. I mean, I tell us it doesn't happen because you can get through it, you can move on, life can still be good. It's always, it's a rough week. It can be a Tuesday before it be a long day. And I kind of relive it that day and put it aside. I might cry all day Tuesday, and I won't cry for a year. But anyway, 25 years is a long time. Big anniversary. I have great grandchildren, I have children, my children are great. But every now and then they're having a really rough day or they hear somebody whine. We don't put up with whiners. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm a cowgirl, you know I'm a cowgirl up kind of girl. If something bad happens, just pick them up, swat them on the butt and keep going. Because that's all you can do and that's the only way you can get through it. But my kid says, oh, so and so said they had a bad day. And we're like, let me tell you what a bad day is. You have no idea what a bad day is. But I do, and my children do. But when you stood up here this morning and said I'm a suicide survivor, it's like, okay, Lord, I'm not a good call. Tuesday's the day, and this is a hard day, hard week for me and my family, so I'll pray for my children. I'm okay, I'm good. I got such faith that I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> but, oh, I, I hurt, constantly hurt. Grew up without a dad. It, it, it's just been a mess. But we survived, and, and it's you're all good. Able to feel like that. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not wrong. I'm okay. okay. And the one thing I, I wanted to say, and I, I did forget. Um, you know, whenever we have those bad days, and I said this to Scott, um, I do something for somebody else, and you think, how's that going to make you feel better? You'd be surprised when you put a smile on somebody else's face how much better you feel. Um, I'll buy someone a cup of coffee that's standing in line at Sheets or a couple people. Um, you know, going and serving din dinner and lunches at the rescue mission, you are making a huge difference. Even picking up the phone and calling someone or texting someone you have not seen in weeks or maybe talked to in years and just say, hey, you know, I had a feeling I needed to reach out to you today. You will truly feel so much better. Thank you. Thank you very much. About a year ago, I sent a letter to some of the key leaders of the church and said, I am not in a good spot. And uh, I said, in the future, if I take off more, if I use more vacation time than what you think I deserve, uh, show grace to me. And it has been... All through COVID, really, um, you know, I probably have PTSD from the ambulance. Um, the ministry was impossible all during COVID. You do this, half the people are upset. If you do this, the other half are upset. Want to get back in the church. Don't want to get back in the church. And, and it's just, and, uh, and it's been years and, uh, and when this revival happened in Wilmore, Kentucky, I, I really almost felt like God had abandoned America. Uh, why wouldn't he? If I was him, I would. And uh, last summer, we had a couple people who came to the dinner. They ended up singing. Uh, they, they're from Florida, they were standing at the campground, and they, they said they drove by and kept seeing, they were here for about a month in the area, and they kept seeing our sign, free dinners, and the guy said, there's something special about that place. And he said, uh, so he said, we got to go to a dinner there. And they came to a dinner, they ended up singing, then they ended up coming the next week and singing at the dinner, and... 
And I, and I spoke to her just a little bit, and I said, what a tough time it's been. But now God is starting to do these amazing things again, like send us people from Florida to sing at our Tuesday dinner. And I said, and she said, but you know what? She said, you've, you've, you've felt that way for the last two and a half years, but she said, yet still, here you are, serving dinners on Tuesday nights. Uh, and so things started to open up a little bit, but when the revival happened in Wilmore, Kentucky, my soul was renewed. My you know, everybody was driving to Wilmore. They had tens of thousands of people. They, they had to put up signs, Wilmore is closed. Because everybody was driving to Wilmore. And we don't have to drive to Wilmore. Like, God is here. Do you believe he was here today? Do you believe that, that God had Nikki sweeping last week for a reason? So I had no clue about any of this. She just said she's a survivor and uh, she's had first aid, mental first aid, and that's all I knew. I didn't, we didn't talk about any of this. I had no clue what she was going to say. And, the, and, the, and then God brings Kim here, to, but, but it's not just for Kim. It's for me. Now, have I ever been abused? Only by church people, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes I just make jokes to... Because I can't do anything else. Just to lighten the mood. Um, but you know, we read Romans. I mentioned to you when we started, I, we read Romans went to, uh, Wednesday night this past week. So I, I, I told Colby, bring up Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Here's where I want to end the service today. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is not the verse that I brought, brought it up for. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and forever, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Do you know that God has Jesus right there at his right hand making intercession for you? You know what intercession is? It's, it's what we do for our boys when we pray for them. It's what your mom does for you when she prays for you. Goes to the Lord on your behalf. Jesus is talking to God on your behalf. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? What do you think? No! As it is written... For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, in every bad thing, this is probably the greatest verse in the Bible. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Is it did Nikki make it through this on her own power? No. Did I make it to this point in not quitting as a pastor? Now, some of you don't know this, but Diane and I could have another house we could go to at any minute at the beach. <laughs> blessed us with it, but that's another story. <laughs> it is of no credit to me that I'm still standing here before you today. I would have quit. 
For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nothing today and nothing to come, not height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because we are more than conquerors. We are children of the King. The Savior of the world. The God who created the heavens and the earth sent His only Son to die for you. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What we pray for our enemies is that they would be saved. What we pray for our sons and daughters is that they would be saved. And so today I want to close in prayer uh, with a salvation prayer. And then uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, definitely uh, if you after the prayer will uh, Joyce, you can just come play some music. You can play what you played at the beginning if you want to. I love that song. <clears throat> or whatever you had planned is perfect. So I'm going to pray. Uh, you're welcome to come to the altar. Uh, we have a policy here that nobody comes to the altar alone. When I remember one time... 12, 15 years ago, Bishop Light, who was our bishop back then, uh, said he knew he found his church when somebody went to the altar. And he said, in, in, in my church, nobody went to the altar alone. And he said, and that's how I knew I found my church. And so nobody wondered why you come to the altar, and nobody leaves you there alone. So let me pray. I always just thank you so much for Nikki's testimony today of your redeeming purposes. What a, what, a, what a phrase, Lord. Redeeming purposes. You tell us that you have this amazing way to bring good out of the devil's most heinous, actions. You tell us that, that there is a love that you have for us that surpasses the highest mountain and surpasses the lowest valley. And that there is nowhere that we can run from your love. And so today, God, uh, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for hearts that you have softened today, maybe even to, to receive your son Jesus Christ as Savior today. Yes. And so God, uh, if, if there's anyone here today who for the first time uh, realizes or maybe has known uh, that they do not have a relationship with you and that uh, if they were to die today, that they would spend eternity apart from you. God, I thank you that you've brought them to this realization today. Now take them one step further, Lord. God, forgive me, for I have fallen short. I have sinned against you, and I want you to forgive me. And I know that your word says you will, because Jesus died on the cross for me. And so I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me of my sins. And created me a clean heart. Lord, there's some of us here who wish we could just get saved again today. It's so awesome. But if, but if that's you for the first time today, uh, then God hears your prayer. He loves you. And he claims you as his child. And for the rest of us, Lord, who would say that we are yours and that we know that we're yours, even if, even if, we have not done everything uh, perfectly, which none of us have. Uh, we thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. And for those who know they're not yours and who are not ready today, Lord, uh, keep wooing them. Uh, 
until that day that it is their day. So we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're just going to have Joyce play here for a couple minutes. Fill my cup. Yeah. Don't type in Lord because it might need a comma and you don't know how to do punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> Is it there? <coughs> Fill my cup.